Sophia Loren is one of the greatest actresses ever to grace the silver screen with an honorary Academy Award for career achievement from the Oscars, the position of number 21 on the American Film Institute's list of the 25 greatest female stars in American film history, and the only one still living as of 2023, and the record for the most David Donatello Awards from the Academy of Italian Cinema alongside Margarita Boi, Alberto Sordi and Vittorio Gassman. Today I will be doing one of her iconic makeup looks. I've chosen to go with the 1950s as many people have done the very classic 1960s style that you can see here. YouTube is filled with those so I thought I would go with a different look of hers so they're not just repeating the same pattern all the time and because I tend to prefer her look from the 1950s anyway. And I'll be talking about her life and career. So join me for this next installment of the Hollywood Icon Suite. If you want to check out the earlier videos, I have linked them up above, but this will be the first in the official series with this particular format. So let's get chatting about the life, the career, and the scandals of Sophia Loren. What have you got? If you Sophia Loren is known for such films as the 1961 war drama Two Women, directed by Vittorio Sica, for which she won an Oscar for Best Actress and became the first ever actor or actress to win an Oscar for a non-English speaking role. I know many of us in the Vintage community know her for the film Yesterday, Today and Tomorrow, with that very famous stocking strip scene. And of course, Marriage Italian Style, for which she won her second Oscar nomination. So starting at the beginning, Sophia Loren was born in Rome in Italy on September 30, 1934. And her real name, I have to get this right, so excuse me, is Sophia Costanza Brigida Villani Ciccolone. It's a mouthful. She was the illegitimate child of railway worker Riccardo Ciccoloni uh, Murillo and piano teacher and aspiring actress Romilda Villani. Sophia and her mother were actually abandoned by her father, who actually came from money and noble lineage, but was obviously one of those rich dicks, literally, who got a woman knocked up twice, not just with Sophia, but her sister, and then left her to fend for herself. So Lorraine was actually raised in her maternal grandmother's home along with her sister and her mother. And as I say, her sister was actually also her father's illegitimate child, but uh, he refused to even acknowledge that she was his child. And Sophia actually used her first paycheck as an actress to pay for her father's recognition for her sister. And her mother, she ran a pub out of the lounge room of the home and she served homemade liquor to the American GIs and Sophia's mother and sister performed. Uh, they sang and they played piano to entertain the troops and Sophia acted as hostess and waitress. But she did also perform a bit as well. She has said that in interviews that she always had that performer spirit. Sophia's mother had always wanted to be a star, had wanted to be a performer, but it hadn't worked out for her. So she really backed this for Sophia, who developed at a very young age. And already by the age of 14, she was entering a local beauty pageant, which she didn't win, but she did become a runner up. I think she was in the top 10 and she won some money, which her mother and she used to move to Rome to pursue the modeling and acting career for Sophia that her mother had always wanted for herself. At age 15, Sophia entered the Miss Italia competition. This was how she initially got started and got discovered. And she entered under the moniker Sophia Lazaro, which would also go on to be her early stage name for her film career as well. In the competition, she did end up taking the title of Miss Elegance 1950, and she caught the eye of one of the judges, producer Carlo Ponti, who would go on to play a huge role in her life and career. Now, Sophia has told various stories about how she and Ponty actually met and connected. One is that she first met Ponty in the Miss Italia competition. He was one of the judges. But the other is that he spotted her in public while she was out in Rome one night dancing with a friend. 
Either way, it was a major turning point in her life. Apparently, Ponty took her for a screen test, which did not turn out at all how she was expecting. As the cameraman commented to Ponty within earshot of Loren that she was impossible to shoot because her face was too short, her mouth too wide, and her nose too long. But the girl had balls because when Carlo decided to try and suggest to her that maybe she could do something about her prominent feature, she said to him, and I quote, Carlo, if you're suggesting that in order to make movies, I'm going to have to slice off a piece of my nose, or well, that I'm going back to Brizzoli, her hometown, because I have no intention of getting a nose job. Like, she was 16 years old. Like, you fucking go, girl. <laughs> what a boss. <laughs> And she was quickly proven right in that decision to stand up for herself because whilst living in Rome, she enrolled in the local film school, the Centro Sperimentale di Cinematografia. I am going to have to read some of this stuff, guys, because it's in Italian, so I don't want to mess that up. I'm probably messing up the accent anyway, but that's life. So within the very same year that she enrolled at film school, she got cast as an extra in the 1951 Mervyn Leroy film, Qua Vadis, Qua Vadis, probably saying that wrong as well. And she got a bit part in the film, bear with me, Era Louis C.C. C. <laughs> in 1953, Carlo Ponti, along with another producer, Geoffrado Lombardi, changed her name from Sophia Lazaro to Sophia Loren. The name was derived from the Swedish actress Marta Torin and was designed to make her image and her name more appealing to American audiences. Ponty had a plan. He also requested that she cut her hair short and wear suits because he felt this really suited her and would appeal to American audiences. And within the next 12 months, Loren was cast in her first starring role in Aida. It was a mere two years since she had enrolled at film school and less than a year later, she would have her breakthrough role in Vittorio De Sica's 1954 film, The Gold of Naples. By 1955, she had been in over 30 films in the Italian film industry and was working tirelessly on the scene there. And she was filming up to as many as nine films in a 12 month period. I mean, she wasn't always the star, but Damn, was that girl busy. Over the next few years, she picked up roles in American films being filmed on location in Europe, including Boy on a Dolphin and The Pride and the Passion. The latter also starred none other than Frank Sinatra and Cary Grant. Just a little piece of information to tuck away in your brain for later. By 1958, Loren had herself an offer from none other than Paramount Pictures to relocate to Hollywood for a five picture deal. Now, although she was getting plenty of work on the Italian film scene, this Hollywood based opportunity was welcomed because at this time there was not one, but two scandals casting a dark shadow over Loren's life. So she and Ponti, who was 22 years her senior, so he was 37 when he met her when she was 15, had started a love affair in 1956 when Lorraine was about 19, 20 years old and the two wanted to marry. So although Ponti was long separated from his wife and the mother of his two children, divorce was very much frowned upon in the very Catholic Italy of the time and was in fact banned by the Vatican. To complicate things further, Cary Grant, who was 30 years Loren's senior, no judgment, she just obviously had a type, had taken a role in The Pride and the Passion that was shooting on location in Spain to escape his marriage troubles. And he was shamelessly pursuing Sophia Loren. Once again, Loren's accounts of her affair with Cary Grant greatly vary depending on the interview that she is doing. Sometimes she claimed that Grant was begging her to marry him. And other times she claimed that there was no actual proposal, but the two had fallen quickly and madly in love. 
So much so that Grant actually requested that Loren be cast opposite him in the 1958 film Houseboat instead of his wife, Betsy Drake. I mean, that's seriously awkward. <laughs> she did it too. She did the role. Those two had no shame. Carlo Ponti apparently even knew about the affair, uh, which was apparently not consummated according to Loren, but you know, like her stories change so much that I take pretty much anything she says with a grain of salt at this point. In one interview that I watched, she told a story about a time that Grant bought her some yellow roses and she took the roses with her onto a flight back to Italy with Ponti and bragged to Ponti about the fact that Cary Grant had given her the roses because he absolutely adored her. Apparently, Ponti hit her. She says lightly, and it was nothing to be dramatic about, her words, not mine. And it was at that point that she knew that he really cared about her and that he was the one for her and not Grant. I mean, if you're asking me, neither of these guys sound like a good option, but you know, different times. In another recollection, she says that she was on set one day with Grant and somebody walked onto the set and announced that the papers had just released a story stating that Ponti and Loren's lawyers over in Mexico had managed to secure Ponti a divorce from his wife and had married Loren and Ponti by proxy. And Loren said that apparently Grant turned to her and graciously said that he wished the couple all the happiness in their future together. Both versions of how Loren ended up choosing Ponti are very dramatic and very poetic and so Loren's style. I mean, she's an absolute hoot in her interviews. In one, a reporter asked her what Carlo Ponti would have thought about her revealing all these things about her romantic encounters early in their relationship and her career. And she responds by just saying, my Carlo would have just smiled. I mean, she's nothing if not a beguiling woman. So back to Loren's newly budding Hollywood career. Under her Paramount contract, she starred in the films Desire Under the Elms, The Black Orchid, That Kind of Woman, Houseboat, I imagine rather awkwardly with Cary Grant, and Hella in Pink Tights. I haven't actually, I don't think I've seen any of those. I've watched quite a few Sophia Loren films, but more her greater known ones and her Oscar nominated and Oscar winning ones. So. I'll have to check them out. She was also loaned out to Columbia Pictures during this time for the film The Key. So during this time, Loren was basically being typecast as one of the wave of exotic sex kittens coming from Europe alongside the likes of Gina Lola Brigida and Bridget Bardot. And this exotic sex kitten was pitted up against the classic American sort of pinup style, the Marilyn Monroe types, the Jane Mansfield types, the Mamie Van Doren types. You can see this most prominently in this really well-known picture of Sophia Loren and Jane Mansfield. This is actually at a party in 1957 that Paramount threw to welcome Sophia Loren to Hollywood. So apparently Jane Mansfield enters the building. She was already well known at this point for her publicity stunts, usually including some sort of wardrobe malfunction. So this reputation preceded her as she approached the table. In an interview many years later, Loren said that Mansfield walked up to her table, clearly tipsy, and quote, suddenly I found one of her breasts in my plate. The image went around the world. I refused to autograph it. I'm staring at her nipples because I'm afraid they're about to come onto my plate. In my face, you can see the fear. Oh, she has never admitted it, but I would not be surprised if she was in on the whole thing and it was a publicity stunt put together by Paramount. <laughs> I think one of the saddest things about how starlets of the golden era were pitted against each other is how isolating it must have been, especially as a foreign actress. The media used to do petty things like compare their body measurements, their incomes, their success with the audiences, and even things as ridiculously demeaning as asking them to do a bust measuring contest on the red carpet. This was between Gina Lola Brigida and Sophia Loren. Lola Brigida actually refused to do the contest, which Loren very casually said was because Lola Brigida knew that she would lose against her. 
But I really think it's sad that they were pitted against each other for like publicity stunts and to sell newspapers and, and you know, make waves in the media and always be in the media. I mean, studios of that time were known for participating in and even completely fabricating or creating these scandals in the media and I just think that's really sad because instead of you know two Italian actresses having someone to turn to and get support from living in a different country speaking a different language and you know going into the Hollywood machine they were lifelong rivals and that's just really tragic. So by age 23 Loren had made well over 30 films and was making a significant place for herself in Hollywood but hadn't even seen New York let alone the rest of the country. In an interview from her home in 1958 Lorraine revealed to Edward R Murrow that since moving to the country she had only seen her apartment Sunset Boulevard which her apartment looked over and the Paramount lot. But her stint living in Hollywood would only be short-lived because she and Ponti were still trying to get married and wanted to start their life together in Italy. However, the two discovered upon their return trip to Italy that their marriage had been declared illegal and Ponti was being threatened with the charge of bigamy and Loren with the charge of concubinage aka living with a married man. So the two actually had to go to court and deny their marriage and then continue their relationship under the radar of the Italian authorities. In 1960 Loren was cast in Vittorio De Sica's war drama two women. Now I won't say much more about it other than that it is a story of a mother and daughter uh, during World War II, uh, the very 1960s interpretation of the 1940s, but we did actually watch it as our monthly movie club film for Patreon last month and just like trigger warning in case any of you do decide you want to watch it. It is a phenomenal film but it deals with some very very heavy themes that you would not expect of the era because it is Italian film, it is not Hollywood film so it doesn't have the same kind of censorship uh, and it is it is heavy stuff but it is phenomenally shot, it's amazing storytelling, um, it's deeply moving and Sophia Loren is absolutely outstanding in her role. Now Sophia was actually cast as the daughter but she fought for the role of the mother. Keep your hands to yourself you miserable thing! Put that rock down. Do what he says. Mama. And she made the right choice because this film really was a turning point in her career not just because of her performance but because of the accolades that it brought her. She was so good in this role that it garnered her 22 awards. She got a Khan Best Performance Award, a BAFTA for Best Foreign Actress and of course the Oscar for Best Actress which again was the first time anyone had won an Oscar for a non-English speaking role and she also won a David Donatello Award for Best Actress. Where previously Lorraine had been cast in lusty and buxom roles as a sex symbol luring men into sin. Starring Sophia Loren in her most startling role as Kay, the kind of woman who turns every man's head. <laughs> Her role in Two Women allowed her to demonstrate her prowess as a dramatic actress. This was the starting point for a decade as one of the most successful actresses of the 1960s where she took many roles across both the US and Europe. Loren juggled her huge career success during this time with her ongoing desire and dream for the idyllic European family life. Now Ponty tried to make this happen for her by continuing to pursue a divorce with his wife and eventually convinced his wife in 1962 to move with himself and Loren to France where they all became citizens for the purpose of divorcing his wife and then marrying Sophia Loren which his wife agreed to. She was extremely accommodating I mean either she really cared for Ponty and Loren or she was just so over him at this point that she would have done anything to divorce him and get him out of her life. 
So this finally all came to fruition in 1965 when they all managed to secure their French citizenship and Lorraine and Ponty finally married. And they stayed married until Ponty's death in 2007. Now Lorraine maintains to this day that Ponty was the love of her life. Uh, the two endured so many things together, like all of these hurdles that they had to get through. And then after they were finally married, they had multiple miscarriages, which is extremely tragic and something that a lot of couples don't make it through, you know? So it's really quite a romantic story in a lot of ways. Okay, I gotta get this lippy on and get onto my hair. But I said this in the Yvonne de Carlo one as well, that is really hard to judge how long it is gonna take me to do the makeup compared to reading the script. <laughs> All right, so I'm gonna get these all out quickly and I will be back to tell the rest of the tale. I was intrigued about what happened between her and Cary Grant and whether that went any further. Apparently they did remain friends, but uh, he did call her years later to say goodbye. Uh, and she said that she thought he must have known that he was sick at that point because he, he passed away not long after that. So that's like, it's quite tragic, really. So although Lorraine took significantly less roles after becoming a mother, it didn't really make much of a difference to her popularity. She continued to be a huge star and make films which brought her accolades. She even got nominated for another Oscar. She got numerous Golden Globe Awards and continued to pick up seven more David D David Donatello, da, 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 David Donatello Awards. She also got the Cecil B. DeMille Award. And her most recent performance was actually, as I mentioned, in her son's film just last year. Uh, I think it's still available on Netflix and it's called The Life Ahead. I haven't seen it, but I did see an interview between her and her son. I would actually recommend watching the interview. It's the best interview by far that I watched. I really enjoyed it. It's just very natural. He asked a lot of questions that other people just don't bother to ask her and talks to her about what it's like to work with her as an actress and like what her methods are, uh, but also because it's her son, like how that impacted playing the role, etc., uh, and how she approached it. It's just a really fantastic interview. The performance looks really fascinating. It's like about uh, mental health in, in aging and they talk about her commitment to her performance. There is a scene apparently where she has to sit in the rain for a really really long time and not blink because her character is having like a, a breakdown and yeah they were just talking about her commitment to that and her son was just so surprised that she was able to do that especially at her age but just like her commitment to doing something so incredibly uncomfortable for the role and I think that just goes to show what an amazing actress she was and that she wasn't just an Italian sex symbol, she really was an actress. And she was a trained actress as well, like it's, it's quite a famous, I forget who said it, but there's quite a famous quote by an Italian director saying that they find their actresses on the street and that they're beautiful, but they're not really actors, you know, they're, they're just beautiful people. And I think Lorraine breaks that mold, you know, she is, a genuine dramatic actress who worked really, really hard to be really good at her craft. So I've seen Yesterday, Today and Tomorrow. I have not seen Marriage Italian Style. I don't think so. There is one where I have seen her where she, no, 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 that's uh, Yesterday, Today and Tomorrow is the one, it's like multiple different stories. So no, I haven't seen Marriage Italian Style, which is the one that she got the second Oscar nomination for. So I really will have to watch that. But I highly recommend watching Two Women. That was just honestly one of the best films I've seen. It, it was really interesting to look at the war from the point of view of another country and also from the point of view of a civilian. It was just a really great story, let alone the phenomenal acting by Lorraine. It was so fascinating to learn about her life and career. She was so interesting and I recommend watching interviews with her. When she was younger, she was less saucy in her interviews. I guess, you know, she was just getting started in the US and so she was probably trying to find her feet. When she's older, from like the 1970s onwards, her interviews are hilarious. She's so sassy, she's sexy, she flirts with everyone that's interviewing her. She's just really fun. <laughs>
I think the story of her life from growing up as someone who was in the war, entertaining, you know, GIs. She even got injured and had like a piece of shrapnel hit her in the face and and hit her jaw. So many movie stars of that era went through World War II and got through that whole career. I mean, I suppose it probably helped them in their acting in a lot of ways, but you know, endured post-traumatic stress disorder and all this stuff that happened to them. And I'm sure that the experiences that Sophia Loren had are things that she drew upon. She does talk about that in the interview with her son, that she has to go into a place inside herself and draw upon things that happened in her life so that when she's bringing those emotions up, they really are real on, on camera, you know? It's so interesting that she then went on to play the role in Two Women about an Italian woman in, in Italy during the war, you know? We, we hear a very glamorized story of her and her family entertaining the troops in the pub in their house, but I'm sure that, you know, that had some very dark aspects to it as well that she doesn't touch upon. So I hope you enjoyed the story, guys. I really enjoyed researching this one. There are plenty more to come. There are three more in this first series. Up next will be Natalie Wood, and I will also be doing Hedy Lamarr and Ava Gardner. This is the final look. I mean, her main things is the way that she puts her eyeliner on so that it all curves upwards towards her extremely high brows. And in the 1950s, there are photos of her with like, that is some heavy eyebrow makeup, <laughs> which is sort of how I've had to go with it because my eyebrows are quite rounded. They're not big and pointy like hers were. And she has much more sort of this, she has much more of a wide forehead than I do, but yeah. So that's the video guys. Thank you as always to my patrons for supporting my content and providing the funds for tools and supplies for the videos. If you're interested in becoming a patron, do check out the link down below. If you're interested in more vintage tips and tricks, you can always follow me on my Instagram. Otherwise, I will see you in the next video. Bye.